Well, I had mentioned uh, earlier during our announcements that uh, this morning is the beginning of our Global Outreach Month, where we're going to be taking four Sundays focusing on God's heart for the lost. And our theme for this Global Outreach Festival is Lost and Found. And each Sunday we will be focusing on parables of the lost. And so I'm very excited about uh, hearing what God has to say uh, to us uh, in regard to that. And more importantly, us uh, really uh, developing God's heart towards those who are lost but need to be found. And this morning uh, we are kicking off our Global Outreach Month and we're kicking off our uh, Redwood Coast School of Missions. And uh, this, this morning I have asked uh, Pastor Brad Adley to come and share with us. Uh, Brad and I uh, have known each other for about 15 years. Brad was with us last year. Uh, he also opened up for us last year with both the uh, Global Outreach Festival and the uh, uh, Redwood Coast School of Missions. Uh, we pastored together uh, at a large church in uh, Campbell, San Jose area. His office was right across from, from mine. He could hear me snoring. I could hear him snoring. And, uh, but we had a wonderful time of uh, partnering together in ministry. Brad has a very uh, rich history in ministry-related things. He has served as a uh, senior pastor, as a teaching pastor. He is... Uh, gone on numerous uh, short-term missions trips throughout his uh, time of, of service, and I'm just honored to have him with us, and so let's uh, just honor our brother and welcome him to our Cater First Family. Pastor Dennis said uh, he would introduce me at the appropriate time. I started to pray and say, Lord, please let that appropriate time come. <laughs> and he don't forget to introduce me and give me a chance to speak. So I came. And I'm glad to be here. And um, what I'd like to do is, before I begin, is um, if I could ask for your help uh, this morning, one of the things about the Word of God is it's an inerrant, it's inspired, it's infallible, but we're not. Right? We're not infallible. We are fallible people. I'm a fallible preacher, and uh, I hate to break the news to you, you're fallible people. And um, so we need God's word to come into us and change us, but we'll miss out on his best for us if we don't hear with faith, if we're not hungry, if we're not thirsty for his word, and if our hearts are not ready to obey. And so what I would ask you to do is would you pray all the way through this message for yourself, that, that God, that the Holy Spirit would continue to work on your heart to help you to hunger and thirst for Him and for His Word, to help you to obey, to help you to hear with faith. And please pray for me so that I will be fully dependent upon the Holy Spirit. Would you do that with me and, and for everyone? And don't just pray for yourself, pray for everyone here as well. We really want to walk out of here differently than when we came in and we want to make an impact to those that don't know the Lord yet. Amen? Amen. Would you join me in prayer? And we'll get right into singing God's word. Father, I thank you for every single man and woman here, a young person here this morning. I thank you for this church. I thank you for the fruit that is coming forth uh, through this ministry. And come now, Holy Spirit, lead, guide, direct, glorify the Father. Glorify the Son and help me, Lord, to teach and preach your word in a way that pleases you, that blesses your people, that brings the lost to faith in Jesus, and that uh, glorifies your name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Well, um, I don't know if anyone has ever seen this book. Kind of pulled this out of the wrappers. Anybody ever read the, the book Knowing God by J.I. Packer? One hand, a couple hands. This is an old classic. It was written in 1973. And I want to read a quote from J.I. Packer. He asks a question uh, in the book, and probably it's, it's the most profound thing that he mentions in this book. 
He says, what is a Christian? What is a Christian? Then he goes on to give a pretty enlightening answer. And here's what he says. He writes, the question can be answered in many ways, and we know that, I think. But the richest answer I know of is that a Christian is one who has God for his father. A Christian is one who has God for his father. He says, you sum up the entire New Testament, the entire New Testament teaching in a single phrase, if you speak of it as the revelation of the fatherhood of the Holy Creator. He goes on and he says, if you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity or understands his faith, find out how much he makes of the thought of being God's child and having God for his father. If this is not the thought that prompts and controls his worship and prayers and his whole outlook on life, it means that he doesn't understand Christianity very well at all. For everything that Jesus taught, everything that makes the New Testament new and better than the old, everything that is distinctively Christian is summed up in the knowledge of the fatherhood of God, or I like to call it the father heart of God. He says, Father is the Christian name for God. And so, loved ones, this morning, Packer has asked us one of the most important questions of all, hasn't he? How well do we know God as our Father? How well do you know God as your Heavenly Father? How would you answer that question? Well, my answer is that I know Him as my Heavenly Father, but not nearly as deeply as I'd like to know Him as my Heavenly Father. I feel like I know God is my Heavenly Father about this much, but compared to when I began the Christian faith 33 years ago, it's this much. And it's this much and far more. God will give me as much of His heart as I want. And He will give you as much of His heart as you want as well. Our triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, wants me to understand the Father heart of God infinitely more than I do. And you know the same holds true for you as well. And so I have one goal in this message this morning. One goal. And that is to inspire us to know God our Father in a more deep way. In a deeper way. Please pray for everyone that that everyone will respond to the prompting of the Holy Spirit to know God our Father in a deeper way. So the title of today's message is, What is a Christian? And it's one who knows God as his Father. I think in your outline, the title, uh, that part of the title is blank. What is a Christian? One who knows God as his Father. Now church, the only way to know God as your Heavenly Father is from His Word, through His Spirit, and through the influence and the inspiration of other believers. I've grown in my understanding of the fatherhood of God as I watch how other believers respond to a situation or respond to a person. We're going to see that in our passage today. And we're best in the entire Bible to come to know and understand the Father heart of God. I could make an argument that it would be in the parable of the prodigal son. The parable of the prodigal son. Luke chapter 15, if you'll turn with, with me there in your Bibles, I think we'll probably have it up on the screen as well. Luke chapter 15. And the parable itself is in verses 11 through 32. But I think it's very important that we look at the overall or the broader context. And so we're going to look at verses 1 through 3 to begin with. Luke chapter 15 and verses 1 through 3. The main goal of this message is that we would come to know God as our Heavenly Father more deeply. Luke chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. Luke says, Now all the tax collectors and the sinners were coming near to him to listen to him. 
He says, all the tax collectors. Who were the tax collectors in that society? We, we really can't relate to that so much. Unless you've been audited by the IRS. <laughs> tax collectors back then were like the mob. They were extortions. They were evil, rotten people. They were Jews who sold out to the Roman government and enriched their pockets by extortioning extorting money from the common people, giving a certain portion to the Roman government, and then becoming very wealthy themselves. They were absolutely hated and despised. You remember who one of the 12 disciples of Jesus was? Matthew. He was a tax collector. Can you imagine how well he might have gotten along with Simon the Zealot? Boy, that would have been interesting to see the sparks fly in relationship with those two. They were, they were arguably the most despised people in that society. He says, now all, there's a lot of people here that are tax collectors, all the tax collectors and the sinners. These are not just your ordinary brand of sinners. These are the worst of the worst, the most despised in that society. All the tax collectors and the sinners were coming near him to listen to him. That little Greek word, to listen to him, means to receive news of, means to give heed to, it means to understand. It wasn't just, well, I'm going to check this guy out, see, see what he has to say. If I like it, I'll, I'll take what I like and throw away what I don't like. You know, there was, a, there was an earnest desire to hear what Jesus had to say. Because their lives were being changed. They weren't satisfied with who they were and where they were at. But, verse 2, both the Pharisees and the scribes, the religious leaders of Israel at the time, began to grumble, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. Right. What does he mean by that? To eat with someone in the Middle East means that you accept them. They're very hospitable people. And they were aghast that, that this rabbi, so to speak, would invest time with the dregs of society. Jesus believes in global outreach, doesn't he? And so he taught a parable. Verse 3, he told them this parable, saying, now there's actually three parts to the parable, or technically there could be three parables. So he goes on, and he gives a brief parable about the lost sheep. Then the next parable is also a brief parable about the lost coin. And then we come to the parable of the lost son. Really, there are two lost sons in this parable, in this teaching. We could also title the parable the compassionate father or the forgiving father. So join me now in Luke 15, verse 11, as we get into... Perhaps the most famous parable of all, and that is the parable of the prodigal son. And he said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me. This is a, a command. He, this younger son is commanding the father. Father, give me the share of the estate that belongs to me. And so he divided his wealth between them. As we get to know this father a little bit more as we move into this parable, you've got to know that his heart began to break. This father's heart is breaking for his son because of the lost condition that his son is in. And because he knows that the son is headed for major pain. And yet he lets him go. Something to keep in mind. And so he divided his wealth between them, verse 13. And not many days later, sure enough, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. He's going into Gentile territory. And there he squandered his estate with loose or better reckless living. Now when he had spent everything, 
Isn't it interesting? You get out of the, the protection of God and things, bad, bad things can happen. And sure enough, a severe famine occurred in that country and he began to be impoverished. He began to starve to death. And now he, he sinks even lower. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country and that citizen sent him into his fields to feed swine. What do you know about this? Pigs were unclean to Jews. This young man cannot stoop any lower. It is, it is unimaginable. He could never imagine when he sent on this journey rebelling against his father that he would end up nearly starving to death and sink so low that he would have to feed pigs for a living. And it even gets worse, Jesus says. And he would have, verse 16, gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating and it still gets worse and no one was giving him anything. I think certainly God could have moved upon someone to help him out. But sometimes when we rebel against God, he has to allow us to come to an end of ourselves before we're willing to respond to his grace, his, inv his invitation of grace. But now the Holy Spirit is working on him. And notice in verse 17, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread. Notice that, more than enough bread. But I am dying here with hunger. I will get up and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. So he got up and came to his father. Now in the Middle East, fathers, especially at that time, were autocrats. They ruled. They were in authority. They were extremely well respected. They were very uh, dignified men. Very dignified men. Very much in control. Not weak whatsoever. It's important that we understand that. So he got up and came to his father and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him. And he ran and embraced him and kissed him. For a Middle Eastern father to, to run in that society would have been scandalous because it was undignified. For a Middle Eastern father to run, and the Greek word means to run, I mean to sprint, he would have had to pull up his robe like this, this is the most undignified I've ever been. <laughs> In order to be able to run. And, and he is standing there. No one reports to him. He sees the sun coming. What does that say about what he's been doing? He's been watching for the sun. He sees his son, and, and you've got to think he must have been very loud and ran, my son, my son, my son, my son, oh, my son. I don't think the son was running to him. Because what did the son say? I will go to my father, and I will say to him, I am no longer worthy to be your son. Just make me as one of your higher servants. I don't think the son was running to the father, I think the son was shocked. You know what I found in my three decades in the body of Christ and all my ministry time, even in my own life sometimes, is we Christians don't think we're worthy of the father's heart. And in order to understand the father heart of God, we have to understand our sonship. We have to understand our sonship. You are, if you're in Christ, you are his daughter who he loves. Unconditionally. Perfectly. If you are 
are in Christ, you are his son, whom he loves, unconditionally and perfectly. Let's, let's let the Holy Spirit give us even more insight from this parable. So he, he got up, he came to his father while he was still, I'm in verse 20, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, felt compassion for him, ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son, who had already rehearsed what he was going to say, the son said to him, Father, I have sinned. I mean, he must have smelled. His, his clothes must have been in, in, in tatters. He was a broken young man. Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer to be, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And then he didn't even get a chance to finish his prepared statement. And the father interrupts him and turns and says to his slaves, who must have been running after him, wondering what all the commotion was, quickly, bring out the best robe, which would have been his robe, very colorful, which signifies complete restoration. Bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, which gives him complete restoration of authority to act on the Father's behalf. This man is being raised up from the pit of hell, so to speak, into complete restoration with the Father. Why? Just because he humbled himself and repented of his sin. Brokenness and absolute unconditional acceptance. What a dramatic contrast with this dignified Father who probably didn't show a lot of emotion. These fathers in that Society. This give you an indication of the heart that your Heavenly Father has for you, loved one? Not only that, he says, put a ring on his, on his hand, a signet ring, and sandals on his feet. Not just any sandals, but expensive sandals to restore the dignity of this son. And bring the fattened cap. This, this man, this father was... The wealthiest man in that village, he was really the chief of that village. People rarely had need at that time. He is calling for the, the fat cap to be slain so the whole village can turn out and celebrate. But until that time, the whole village had been talking to one another. Did you hear about this guy? Did you know what's going on? Yes, I know what's going on. An ordinary father would have been absolutely shamed over the rebellion of his son. And now, look what he does. He invites the whole village out. He says, bring the fatted cow, kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. That Greek word is where we get our word euphoria from. This is an intense, exciting celebration, not a low-key celebration. Why? Verse 24, for this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found, and they began to celebrate. But that's not the end of the parable, is it? Do you remember what the beginning of this parable was? All the tax collectors and the sinners were coming near to him to listen to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes said to one another, this man receives sinners and eats with them. Jesus, in his redemptive father heart, doesn't return to railing against them, but still reaching out to these men that absolutely hated him to the point they were planning on killing him, gives them an opportunity to come and be free from their self-righteousness. So they could come to know God is their father, whom they thought they knew, but this parable will show us they didn't know him at all. Notice with me in verse 25 as we finish this parable. Now his older son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing, and this was loud. And he summoned. He ordered one of the servants, and he began inquiring what these things could be. He was asking a lot of questions, but they were really demands. And he said to him, 
out of utter astonishment. Your brother has come back. Your brother has come back, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he received him back safe and sound. Can you believe it? Expecting the older brother to go, yes! I've been praying for him ever since he left, crying out to God that God would deliver him from his deception. Is that what he says? Now, remember now, the Pharisees and the scribes are listening to this. But he became angry. The word is wrathful. Verse 28. And he was not willing to go in. And here comes another shock. The father came out and began pleading with him. Fathers did not plead with their sons. Fathers did not lower themselves to the rebellion and the anger and the wrath of their sons. It just didn't happen. That's why this parable is so stunning. Because Jesus is revealing the true heart of the Father. You see, the son is saying, you got what you wanted. You blew the money. You deserve to pay the price. Just what he was expecting is not what happened. The father began pleading with him, verse 28. But he answered and said to him, said to his father, Look! Can you believe that he would speak to his father that way? For so many years I have been serving you, and I have never neglected a command of yours. Really? Never have I neglected a command of yours, and yet you have never given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes, where did he get that information from? You killed the fattened calf for him. <coughs> he said to him, son, you have always been with me, and all that is mine is yours, but we have to celebrate and rejoice for this brother of yours. You see the difference? This son of yours, and the father turns around and says, this brother of yours, the father is appealing to the son, was dead and has begun to live and was lost and has been found. I grew up with an alcoholic father, and it was bad enough that my he was an alcoholic all, all my life. Growing up in my home was like a verbal war zone. It was emotionally painful. It was full of shame. It was full of embarrassment with strife that was unending. But what I didn't have growing up with my Heavenly Father, His unconditional love, His nurture, His encouragement, His presence, you know, he'd come home, go right to the couch and start drinking, and in no time flat, he was already drunk. But what I didn't have growing up with my earthly father, I've had now for 33 years with my heavenly father. And I've heard many people say that if you grow up with a, a bad or poor example of an earthly father, it's going to affect the way you see your heavenly father forever. Logically, rationally, I can understand that argument, except for the Holy Spirit. Either the Holy Spirit is powerful enough as God to bring that healing and to open up our hearts to see the true Father, or He's not. And He is. So 17 years went by after I had gotten saved. I forgave my dad year after year after year. I always like to say, forgive until you don't need to forgive any longer. And I blessed him, and I prayed for his salvation. 17 years later, he got saved. God did a major work in his life. And I remember, to this day, on the phone, he said to me, he said, I am so proud of you, and I love you. And you know what? What came out of me was such surprise. It felt like, it felt like he needed to hear himself say that. 
Church, I was so secure in the Father's love and in the Father's encouragement for me, it felt like I didn't really need to hear that. Now, I say that imperfectly. I'm sure at some level, of course, it benefited me. But what I'm saying to you is that God took this young man who grew up in such strife and such pain and such difficulty with, with a father who was just not there for me and formed in me an extraordinary adventure to come to know God as my Heavenly Father. And yet I still feel like I know Him as my Father this much, but the exciting thing about my faith is I've got this much to know. And I can come to know Him as deeply as my Father as I want to. But you know what? As I'm coming to know Him as my Father, it should be evidence in the way I treat others. It should be evidence in the way I treat my wife when none of you around can see. It should be evidence in the way I speak about others. And it really should be evidence in how I treat the lost. Isn't that right? Because, because do the lost understand the Father and heart of God? No. No. Some of them are waiting for him to take a heavenly baseball bat and, and strike away. Some of them think he doesn't care. Some of them think he's just an old, old softy. He makes that sense, sure. They might have to do whatever they want. They have a, a, a corrupted, skewed view of the Heavenly Father. So how are they going to know who he is and how wonderful he is if we're not coming to know him as our Heavenly Father as well? Do you see how much at stake there is? Well, I've completely lost track of time. I want to be careful with the time. How much time do I have left? 10 minutes. I'm having such a good time here, I've completely uh, forgotten about this time. There are three things that I want to point out to you. How now do we, how can you learn to go deeper in your relationship with your Heavenly Father? Number one in your outline, the first key part of the parable in knowing God more deeply as our Heavenly Father comes in the first section of the parable, and that is how we handle free will. How we handle free will. Free will is one of the most important things that God has ever given to us. He doesn't, he doesn't force us to love him or obey him. He moves us. We can respond or not respond. This younger son abused that, that free will, did he not? And he paid a great price for it. He became willful. That's the second blank in paragraph number one. He became willful. I'm going to do what I want, when I want, how I want it, and that's it. Proverbs 14, 14 says, The backslider in heart will have his fill of his own ways, but a good man will be satisfied with his. Can I share with you how I've learned and how I'm still learning to handle one of the greatest gifts that our Father has given to us, free will. It's simple. It's a simple, ongoing, but courageous prayer. Father, I surrender to you, not my will, but yours be done. Is that a prayer that our Heavenly Father wants to answer? Will I be better off by praying that kind of a prayer? Did I come up with that prayer myself? Jesus prayed that prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. Will you adopt that kind of praying, loved ones, in order that you can really come to know God as your Heavenly Father so you can use this gift of free will to understand Him and go deeper with Him and know Him as your Father? Paragraph number two in your notes, point number two in your notes. The second key part of, of the parable in knowing God more deeply is as our Heavenly Father, is in cultivating the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord. Clearly, the younger son didn't have the fear of God. Did he? Because the Father represents God the Father. He demanded the share of his estate. The Father said, okay, I'm going to give you what you want. You're not going to stand to reason right now. You're just going to do what you want anyway had to have broken his heart. And then when he was completely broken and came back, he realized that bending his will 
to his father with reverence, with respect, with awe, with honor, brought him to the highest place of all. The older son demonstrated no fear of his father, no reverence, no regard, no respect whatsoever. You know, to be honest with you, I think sometimes when we hear the parable of the prodigal son, we segment ourselves. We think, oh, I'm in that category. I'm in the category of the younger son. I I've got a rebellious heart. Oh, well, most of us probably wouldn't put ourselves in the category of the older son, right? We're not self-righteous. <laughs> <laughs> Generally speaking, we probably aren't, but there's stuff in there, right? We're being sanctified. It's a lifelong process. I think it's a little thing, not a new one. I think we fall into both areas. I think we've got rebellion in our hearts, and I think we've got self-righteousness in our hearts. I don't do that. I'm not like that. Now, we're too smart to actually say that to people outside. But inside here, that, that poison is there. Is our Heavenly Father browbeating us because we have that in there? Or is he wooing us and saying, I've got something better for you. I've got freedom for you. Freedom that makes you more like my son than less like yourself. That's your destiny. To be conformed to his image. To be conformed to the image of his son. How do you know if you're really fearing God? You know, the surest way to know whether we truly fear God is if we obey him. But if we obey him from the heart, Jesus tells us in John 14, 21, he who has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love myself, love him, and I will reveal myself to him. It's the pure in heart that shall see God. That is those who are focused solely on him. How do we come to know God our Father in, in a more deep way? By handling our free will in a way that honors him, by cultivating the fear of the Lord. And then thirdly, paragraph number three in your outline, by developing greater faith in him. I see that even though the younger son's faith was imperfect, I would get up and go to my father. He's got, his servants have more than enough bread. I'll go and just beg him to receive me back as one of his servants. In other words, he had a little bit of an understanding of the goodness of his father, but not a total understanding. The older son showed no faith at all in the father. In his own father. And so I want to leave you with a few practical thoughts in coming to know God more deeply as our Heavenly Father Church. Let me just say, it does not take place overnight. I try to explain to you that I'm on a lifelong journey. I may be here, you may be there, or you may be here. It doesn't matter as long as we're moving forward. It may be baby steps, sometimes it may be great strides. But we just want to move forward through the proper use of our free will, through the proper use of the fear of God, and through the proper growing in faith. And so it, it, it doesn't happen overnight, so don't be discouraged if it doesn't happen right away. Remember that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. That's the first thing, Not so we're not setting ourselves up for failure, is to know this is a lifelong pursuit. A second thought is to exercise, in order to exercise faith, exercise faith in God as our Heavenly Father, make it your intentional habit of addressing Him the way that Jesus taught us in the Lord's Prayer. Father, our Father who is in heaven, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is in heaven. Let me just say this, and I hope it's not in a judgmental way. I don't think it's in a judgmental way. But as I listen to Christians pray, I often hear Christians say, Lord, or Lord God, or Lord Jesus, or Jesus, or, or those kind of things. Are all those valid? Absolutely, absolutely. But what I don't hear is Christians addressing God as God in prayer. So what I want to encourage you, 
as a practical how to get to know our Heavenly Father in a more deeper way, is to take 30 or 40 days, and I know this will be a discipline, but you'll be amazed how, how, how difficult it is sometimes, try to address the Father in prayer alone. I'm not saying that it's wrong. Please hear me. I'm not saying it's wrong to, to refer to Jesus or the Lord God or any of those things. But try to discipline yourself to talk to the Father. Father, thank you for my salvation. Father, thank you that I have shoes on my feet. Father, thank you for this church. Father, thank you for my income. Father, thank you that I have eternal life. Father, thank you for your word. Father, thank you. And just thank him for as many things as you can. Thank you for your love for me. Thank you for your grace for me. And you'll find yourself drawing nearer to your Heavenly Father and coming to know Him in a deeper way. Would you do that? But would you also do another thing? Would you pray, not just for yourself, but pray for one another? Because I believe our Heavenly Father wants all of our Cato First Baptist Church to come to know the Father, heart of God, in a deeper way. So don't just pray this for yourself. Pray for everyone else. And then thirdly, the third thing to pray for is pray that in coming to know our Heavenly Father in a deeper way, we would demonstrate that by how we treat others. Just the way that this father treated, he appealed to the self-righteous older son, he forgave the younger son who was repentant, and not only did he forgive him, he restored him and dignified him and honored him and shocked everybody and open the eyes of everybody to who he really is, let's treat others with the same dignity and honor and respect, Christian and non-Christian alike, and especially in this global outreach focus. The lost need to see a Christian who knows her father. They need to see a Christian who knows his heavenly father and responds in the opposite spirit. Amen? Amen. Is that true? And that's, I think, what, you know, there's so many, we could, I mean, we could, Pastor Dennis could preach on the parable of the prodigal son for three months, and, and still we wouldn't get into all the depth of it. But church, take this on, pray for one another, encourage one another, so that you all can come to know your Heavenly Father more deeply. I'll ask the elders and the prayer team to come forward now, and if you need prayer, it's a good thing the message is done because my voice is gone. Uh, if you need prayer, if it's, if it's to confess your sins, maybe it's rebellion, maybe it's self-righteousness, maybe it's hidden sin, maybe it's secret sin, and you want to come back to, to the Father. If it's to know God as your Father more deeply, you just want prayer for that. If it's to know who you are as His daughter, as His son, maybe you come and you pray for that as well. But the biggest prayer of all is if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want to give you an opportunity to receive him right now. And do you know all that you need to do is ask, just like this younger son asked, God, I've not lived my life for you, but I want to live for you now. I want to surrender my sin. I need your forgiveness. I'm going to stop running from you. I'm going to stop trying to live my life my own way. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're not here by mistake. You're here by divine appointment. And I want to pray a prayer with you. It's a brief prayer. It's a simple prayer. What a safe place to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior among people who love you and who are praying for you right now. If you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, or you want to rededicate your life to Him, would you pray this prayer with me? Lord Jesus, I have never asked you to be my Lord and Savior, or I'm not sure about my salvation. Lord, I give my life to you. Take my life, Lord Jesus. I surrender it to you. Use my life for your glory. And if you have fallen away from the Lord and you want to come back to Him, 
Would you pray this prayer? Lord Jesus, I have strayed away from you, but I need to come back to you now. And so here I am, Lord. I surrender myself to you. Thank you, Lord, for your blood and your forgiveness so that I might really come to know you, Heavenly Father, as my Father. And if you prayed that prayer right now, while every head is bowed and every eye is closed, I don't want to embarrass you. Um, if you just raise your hand, and by raising your hand, you're saying, yes, Pastor God, I pray um, with the Lord right now, uh, and I just want to acknowledge that to the Lord to, to solidify the decision I made. Would you raise your hand just for a moment? Just raise your hand up high. Thank you. I see two hands in the back so far. Um, anybody up, up in the balcony? The Bible says there is more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous. God bless you. Please come forward and let someone know the, the, the decision that you made. I'll turn it over to the worship team. Thank you very much. God bless you.
go and draw near to 